My name is Alexis Kinlan and I'll be hosting today's webinar. I'm an agricultural journalist and the recent novelist of the newly released uh, Mad Cow. The School of Public Policy is Canada's leading policy school known for our practical research and for bringing people together to discuss the important issues with experts, which is what we are here to do today. Thank you all for joining us. If you have to leave early, we post recordings of all our webinars on our website and YouTube channel, and you'll receive a link in the following email. In the follow-up email, I should say. The topic of today's webinar is Antibiotics in Animals, Improving Canada's Meat Supply and Exports. Our speaker today is Dr. Karen Holzer, Senior Officer of the Health Program of the Pew Charitable Trust. For our format today, Dr. Karen Holzer will present for about 20 minutes and then we'll open it up for audience question and answer. Please type your questions in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen and we'll pose them to our speaker. I'd like now to turn this presentation over to Dr. Karen Holzer. Thank you very much, Alexis. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure to be here with all of you uh, virtually today and to talk about antibiotics in animal agriculture. I thought for my presentation today, I would start with just a few words about uh, who the Pew Travel Trusts are and why we care about antibiotic use in animal agriculture. And right on the start, I have to say, we are a US-based organization. So a lot of what uh, you'll hear about today will be through a US-focused lens, but I think a lot of it applies across North America. Then I'll talk about um, taking policy um, into practice and how we have um, worked on research to improve antibiotic stewardship policy. Finally, I'll try to leave you with a few lessons learned on how we can ensure that good science drives agricultural policy. But let's start with who we are as the Pew Chamber Trust and why we care about antibiotics in animals. Um, the Pew Chamber Trust, as the name states, is um, a charitable organization, we're a nonprofit, independent. We've been around for a number of years. Uh, we have our own funding, which keeps the lights on, which is helpful. Uh, we think of ourselves as a global research and public policy organization. And our mission is to improve public policy, inform the public, and invigorate civic life. Our portfolio is quite diverse, reflecting the priorities of our founders uh, that they memorialized in the seven trusts that are funding us today. And I'm showing just a few um, in the graphics on the right here. Um, some of them are more urgent issues in the US than in Canada. Uh, but for instance, we've uh, conducted research on uh, better understanding the student loan crisis. And um, among other findings found that the really problematic um, student loans that are most at risk of defaulting are not the really big um, ones, but the smaller ones um where the students um did not fi finish their degrees so again very interesting um research that helped tailor uh, the right policy solutions by understanding where some of the stressors really lay and then we work on issues such as um prescription drug pricing huge issue in the united states um and one of my favorite topics uh projects is um, the project called Eyes on the Sea, where we worked with the UK government and a satellite company to monitor illegal fishing activity in very remote areas, which allowed the UK government to designate a very remote area as a marine sanctuary. So all this is just to say that we work on a variety of different policy areas. So why do we care about antibiotic use in animal agriculture? We know that we are at risk of facing a post-antibiotic era where simple infections can once again kill us. And we know every time we use an antibiotic, there's a risk of uh, resistance development. We know that humans and animals largely share the same antibiotics. And if you look at total antibiotic use, there's a fair amount of antibiotics going into animal agriculture. This is not to say which one is more judicious, human or animal use. Um, at the Pew Trust, we focus on both, uh, but if you just 
try to make meaningful change in uh, preserving the efficacy of antibiotics, then um, we need to look at animal agriculture as one part of the equation. And I know uh, by and large, the antibiotics that are used in animal agriculture are older than those that are used in human medicine. But um, a number of critically important antibiotics, including macrolides, are quite commonly used in animal agriculture. So again, just emphasizing why we need to take a one health approach that includes human, animal health, and the environment. Which brings me to the second point. We know that what happens on the farm does not always stay on the farm. Uh, obviously, there's foodborne transmission with the uh, food that is generated on the farm. Uh, there's a risk with direct contact on the farm, um, a risk with the environmental runoff. Um, and we know that antibiotic resistance is complex. So we have issues of co and cross resistance, which basically means that um, using one antibiotic can lead to resistance to other uh, antibiotics. Um, so again, just re-emphasizing uh, the need to take a comprehensive One Health approach. And we know that positive change is possible. In the US, in North America, and around the world, we have a history of rapid transformative policy changes. A lot of them were voluntary and market-based. A lot of them um, led to value-added product being generated through um, voluntary antibiotic use restrictions. Um, we've also seen at the uh, state, uh, federal, state, and local level in the US and in Canada uh, policies that uh, promote the judicious use of antibiotics. And we've seen a lot of international action at the highest levels of international government, uh, from the World Health Organization, from the World Animal Health Organization, from the United Nations, really focusing and making positive changes on antibiotic use in animals as well as in humans and the environment. And we know that there's tremendous opportunity for scientific discovery, whether that's new antibiotic alternatives or improved management practices that can keep animals healthy and reduce the need to use antibiotics. So for all these reasons, we care deeply about antibiotic use in animal agriculture. Our goal is not zero antibiotic use. Our goal is antibiotic stewardship. And the way I think about it, it's really about using antibiotics judiciously so that they keep being effective for when we need them in humans and animals, and so that we use them in ways that avoid unintended consequences, be they on human health, on animal health, or on food safety and the environment. So with all that said, how have we used uh, research to improve antibiotic stewardship policy? At Pew, we strongly believe that um, we need research partnership and pu uh, public awareness, and these three themes really underpin our work on antibiotics, as well as uh, pretty much everything we do at Pew. Uh, when it comes to research and analysis, we conduct our own in-house research. Uh, we um, sponsor research at universities, including we just finished a large project at the University of Guelph, um, systematically synthesizing evidence of efficacy for antibiotics and alternatives. And we are big on research collaborations, trying to find partners wherever we can because we know um, if we really want to make a difference, we can only do it collaboratively. Which brings me to the next point. Um, a big focus of our work has been on partnership and uh, technical support, whether that's for industry groups and organizations, uh, for nonprofit organizations, working closely with governments and other key stakeholders. Again, um, if we really want to make progress on a complex issue like this, we all need to um, bring our hands together and work together. And then finally, uh, we do focus on public awareness uh, through our own publications, through press outreach, and through advocacy. And on the right here, I'm just showing a couple of um, relatively recent publications that we uh, issued on uh, the topic. Again, it's more of a US focus, but the former commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, um, Dr. Gottlieb, um, outlined a five-year plan on antibiotic stewardship priorities for the agencies. Um, and he did that at an event that we um, held at our headquarters. Again, showing just um, how uh, closely tied in um, our work is. Um, which brings me to the five-year plan that Dr. Gottlieb um, revealed. Um, and it's really closely aligned with our key priorities. Our key priorities around antibiotic stewardship really 
boil down to three key issues. First, minimizing the need for antibiotics. Healthy animals um, equal to minimized use of antibiotics. Then if antibiotics are used, because animals do sometimes get sick and need antibiotics, then making sure that that use is optimized by making sure a veterinarian um, has an important oversight role, by making sure the antibiotic is used for the right amount of time and that the right antibiotic is chosen. And then really tracking progress on antibiotic use, antibiotic resistance and treatment outcomes uh, to have a better understanding of um, how uh, well policy progress is being made. And on the right hand uh, side of the slide here, I'm showing the five key priorities of five, uh, FDA's five year plan. And at Pew, we are trying to support research and partnership development for all five of these issue areas, including veterinary oversight, uh, making sure antibiotics are used for the appropriate duration, um, getting better data on antibiotic use and resistance, um, updating which antibiotics are particularly important for human health and therefore should be uh, used with particular um, prudence in animal agriculture, and then focusing on the development of antibiotic alternatives. Um, in the next few minutes, I'll just go over some examples of how we've supported the first two of these five priorities, again, in the interest of time, but we are trying to support all of them. Uh, when it comes to veterinary oversight, we have a long history of um, trying to help support um, sound policies on veterinary oversight. And the way we've done that is really through a three-pronged approach. First, demonstrating the value of veterinary oversight, then trying to understand and mitigate any unintended consequences, and drumming up support um, for better oversight. With regard to the first goal of uh, demonstrating the value of veterinary oversight, We've um, funded and conducted research to characterize the value that uh, better veterinary oversight provides both to farmers and to veterinarians. And we try to assess the value of better veterinary oversight to antibiotic stewardship, understanding that uh, there are data scarcity issues. Uh, so we're not quite all the way there yet, having hard numbers, um, but that's certainly been a priority for us. When it comes to better understanding uh, unintended consequences, we have focused on documented challenges to the implementation of improved oversight, um, again, through uh, funding of research at universities. Uh, we have provided funding to organizations that are trying to better understand some of the challenges associated with um, improved oversight. In some parts of the US, for instance, that includes um, veterinary shortages and uh, access issues to veterinary care. And then um, we've tried to uh, conduct and fund work to assess solutions such as telehealth that can help address some of the challenges um, and it, potential unintended consequences of strengthening veterinary oversight. And then when it comes to analyzing, uh, analyzing support for better oversight, we have engaged in grassroots efforts um, trying to mobilize our um, communities um, and um, empowering them to be heard on this issue. Um, the Food and Drug Administration um, provided an opportunity for public comment on um, veterinary oversight issues uh, recently. And uh, we analyzed the public comments that were received uh, for the agency. And we've um, engaged in case studies highlighting how individual farmers are um, dealing with veterinary oversight issues and uh, the value that veterinary oversight is bringing to them. So the second example that I want to talk about uh, with regard to how we've tried to um, guide and improve public policy through research is on um, ensuring that antibiotics have appropriate durations of use. Uh, this is another really longstanding research area uh, for us. At Pew, we started to do that by quantifying the problem. When we started working on this issue about five years ago, we knew that there were a number of antibiotics that didn't have a defined duration of use, but we didn't have hard data on how many um, antibiotics, how big the problem was. Um, so we spent a lot of time <laughs> reading um, through the label instructions on all the antibiotics that are approved in the US for animals. Um, to really quantify the problem. Ultimately, we found out and published 
that about one in three animal antibiotics currently lack defined durations of use. So it's a pretty substantial problem. Uh, we also dove deeper to understand which antibiotics, which reasons of use. And it became really clear that uh, veterinarians need better guidance uh, to optimize the use. And it also became clear a lot of the antibiotics that were problematic were approved a uh, long, long time ago. And um, while the duration of use was clearly a problem, there were other problems, including having a really broad dosage range that didn't give enough instructions to the veterinarian on how to best use these products. And there were some challenges with some reasons of use that were outdated. Again, the problem of antibiotics that were approved 50, 60 years ago and haven't really been updated. After we quantified the problem, we set out to better characterize uh, how, what, what the pro putting the problem into context, understanding um, what impact it would have on animal health and um, agriculture. So we tried to get a deeper understanding of which drugs reasons for use were affected, uh, what other treatment options were available, um, to address the health issues and how important these health issues were both to animal health and to human health and the productivity of the industry. And then the third part was to identify solutions. Um, it became pretty clear that even though many of these uh, one or three antibiotics currently don't have defined durations of use, that doesn't mean that there isn't necessarily any information available, whether that's in veterinary textbooks, whether that's in the published literature, whether that's in the dossier of other related drugs that are very similar um, and that have been approved. So uh, we spend a lot of time looking through that and we are planning to publish that research in the next um, couple of weeks. Um, we also looked at how to prioritize the needs among the antibiotics for which we currently don't have enough data to establish defined durations of use and it became very clear that there's a need to take a long-term vision. Um, a lot of the, or some of the diseases are uh, complex. In the US, for instance, one of these diseases is anaplasmosis, which is um, vector-borne and um, has a lot of um, importance on the management side. When the cattle are first exposed to uh, the pathogen has a huge impact on what the ultimate clinical outcome is. So, um, while antibiotics play a role in managing the disease, there clearly has to be a long-term vision uh, that emphasizes animal health and uh, optimal management practices so that ultimately the reliance on antibiotics can be reduced because um, management, practice, uh, management practices, vaccines, um, other issues clearly play at least as important a role as antibiotics in managing some of these diseases. So that brings us to what are some of the lessons learned? How can we ensure that good science is driving agricultural policy? Again, I'm coming at this from a uh, US focused um, lens, but I think it is true across North America and probably um, throughout the world. Uh, we do live in times of polarization and eroding trust and credibility is more important than ever to be able to make progress. So um, when we think about how we can um, lead to meaningful public policies, I think credibility has to underlie um, and be the foundation for all of it. And then um, I think it's helpful to think through what are the expectations for meaningful policies. First, I think they have to be very clear goals and objectives. Um, they have to be transparent, meaningful, time-bound commitments. Um, there has to be a consistent approach that is focused on the long-term success. And there has to be um, truthful, respectful, honest communication, uh, both around what's going well, but also what set setbacks are and uh, where some of the co uh, concerns might be. So how can science um, and data support um, all of this progress, I think in a variety of different ways, um, really providing the underpinning for what the goals and objectives should be, uh, what commitments are ambitious but feasible in the available time, um, what the long-term success should look like, and then um, 
how to bring people together so that uh, we can have a free flow of uh, information. So ultimately what it boils down to, I think, is credibility should um, must underpin everything. And then there has to be strong um, signs, good partnership. And if those things come together, then we end up with good policy. With that, I would like to thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And uh, my contact information is um, shown on the slide. Uh, please feel free to reach out. I would love to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, doc <clears throat> Dr. Holzer. Um, so and anyone, if you have any questions, you can just submit your questions in the Q&A box below. Um, there will be a collection of the slides sent out with the, um, with the, the longer um, webinar as well, with the recording of the webinar. So one of the questions that came in is, how does your research match up with the EU's approval to curb the use of antibiotics in farm animals? I think it's very, very much aligned. Um, I think the ultimate goal is um, understanding that when antibiotics are necessary, they need to be used um, from an animal health and welfare perspective. But there are lots of opportunities where we can um, do better and where we should do better. Um, and I think science and research is really the way to go there uh, without having unintended consequences and without um, uh, unduly uh, harming animal health. One example um, that I love to cite is on the uh, small animal, companion animal side, um, where uh, the co uh, scientific community um, around the world came, to ca came together uh, to develop guidelines for how certain common diseases uh, with regard to respiratory diseases, urinary tract diseases, dermatological diseases, how they should be handled. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously it was a very complex and at times, I was told contentious uh, debate, but they were able to uh, pull it off and they came up with recommendations. There were lots of um, gaps in the data. There were lots of uh, questions that came up, but that actually spurred a lot of additional research and they were able to update the guidelines and um, actually through that process found evidence that in some cases where the original recommendation had been 14 days of treatment, that the recommendation was revised based on good scientific evidence to three days. Um, and that had a huge impact on antibiotic uh, resistance pressures, but it also had a really positive impact on the owners of the animals who were saving um, a lot of money, as well as on the animals themselves. Uh, so I think it's a really good example that if we have good scientific evidence, if we can bring people together, and if we can ask the right questions um, and have some funding to answer these questions, then we can actually have a win-win where we'd, we would use unnecessary antibiotic use and have a win-win for everyone. So my question is also about just about um, so the collaboration between, you know, human med, I, I know you have a veterinary background, so I'm really curious about how he, doctors who specialize in human medicine and people who specialize in animals are collaborating and cooperating together on this. Like, what does that look like? And have you, are you working with the medical community? Could you just give us a background on that? So as I meant, great question. As I mentioned um, before, at Pew, we're trying to address antibiotic resistance through a really comprehensive approach. So I lead our work on antibiotic use in animals, but we have a project that looks at antibiotic use in uh, hospital settings and mm -hmm. in outpatient settings. So we have an infectious disease, um, actually pediatri uh, pediatrician who is uh, leading that work. Um, as we know, there's a lot of unnecessary use of antibiotics in um, human healthcare settings too. And one of the things that they've been able to do very well uh, was to bring practitioners together uh, and to go through common um, diseases and get agreement with CDC um, on which of these um, diseases really shouldn't be, when antibiotic really shouldn't be a first line um, treatment. So for instance, for a single, uh, simple upper respiratory disease um, in children um, without without any additional uh, predisposing risk factors, everybody agreed um, antibiotics shouldn't be given. And that allowed them then in collaboration with CDC to quantify 
or get some estimate of how much antibiotic use is um, unnecessary, mm -hmm. which was really helpful. It also showed how much that is varying from geographic region to geographic region. So then it helped um, really target where to focus interventions. So I think the short answer is we are working very closely with the uh, human health community. Uh, we're trying to uh, learn from them where we can because um, in some respects uh, with regard to data and some of the things, they are a little bit further along than we are. On the other hand, we can inform them on some of the issues uh, in particular when it comes to taking a population medicine approach where I think um, we have something that they can learn from us and we've been very fortunate at Pew to be able to work very closely. Mm -hmm. So I have one question here. What are some alternatives that farmers in Canada are using if like, if there's a ban on antibiotics and will that cause uh, production costs to rise at a farm level? That's a great question. Um, I briefly mentioned before uh, that we had a large project with the University of Guelph and that was really one of the issues that we were trying to understand. Uh, what is the evidence base? What do we know? What don't we know about how effective these alternatives are? So in the studies, they looked at uh, vaccines and they looked at um, teeth sealants for dairy cattle. So they looked at very specific um, interventions just based on how much time and funding we had available. Uh, and basically what they found was a mixed bag. In some situations, they actually found st uh, strong evidence that adding an antibiotic did not seem to make a big difference. Um, in some situations, they found that the antibiotic alternatives like teeth sealants were working really effectively. In some situations, they found that the way they were currently used, uh, the vaccines weren't terribly effective or weren't effective at all. So again, it depends on a lot of different factors, but ultimately what it's about is um, there are options that can work. Um, where they work, we need to have good evidence for how they should be used to be effective. And if they don't work, we need that information so that we, on the one hand, don't waste our resources on things that don't work and that we know where to target funding uh, for new alternatives. Mm -hmm. So you spoke a little bit about antibiotics getting into the environment and that's, and the unintended consequences of that as a, you know, a, just a spin off of antibiotic use. Um, do you know about some of the research um, that has studied the potential effects of this, or is there a body of research on this topic? There is starting to be a topic, uh, a body of research on uh, this. It's, com it's very complex, as you can imagine, um, just because so many different factors can impact uh, the fate of the antibiotics, how long the antibiotic will survive um, in the environment. Uh, so it's something that um, definitely requires more research. Uh, the other thing that um, in my previous uh, position before I joined Pew, um, I actually was involved in some research trying to understand what is the fate of antibiotics in um, food as the food is being um, manufactured. So for instance, heating of milk, cooking of meat, etc. It's surprising how limited the available data is. So just showing again, um, it's really important to figure out what the right questions to ask are, um, where the data gaps are, and what it to prioritize. We all have limited funding for uh, mm -hmm. research. So what, what are the key questions and the key data points that we really need in order to make an evidence-based uh, policy decision? And at Pew, we've been trying to focus on um, frameworks and coalition building to help with that prioritization understanding we don't live in a world where we have un, um, unlimited resources. So can you comment on how you think we can transform the ideas presented in your presentation into reality? We have been working on that with Pew um, in the US context for at least the last uh, several years. Uh, we've worked very closely with stakeholders across the supply chains, uh, we've worked closely with the public health community, uh, with the federal agencies, with basically anybody who has a stake in it. Um, I think the first point in being able to make progress is um, starting to have that conversation, um, building trust and building understanding, building a common vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, and then it is about, again, figuring out what we know, 
what actions we can and should take based on what we know and how we can close the information gaps that we don't have. I think the worst thing with um, a public health crisis like antibiotics is to get paralyzed by the uh, lack of knowledge, understanding that we need good evidence to drive policies, but oftentimes there are things we do know and actions we can take based on the evidence we have and then come up with a plan for how to revise and refine uh, the policies based on new information that is being collected. And the treatment guidelines that I mentioned before, I think are a really great example of that, um, where consensus was reached on uh, recommendations in light of limited data. Uh, and then there was a plan, or at least um, it turned out that uh, there was more data being generated and then there was a plan for updating the guidelines. So do you think that um, the like commercial success pressures and the pressures of like big business can be weighed too much against human health concerns? And is there a policy strategy that can be used or implemented to fight this? That's a really good question. Um, I actually think when it comes to antibiotics, it's a win-win. Um, where we've seen in the US and across North America and across the world, really, um, the consumers becoming a lot more concerned about um, how antibiotics are being used, um, how the food that they are gener uh, th that we all consume, how is it, uh, how, how it is being um, raised. So I think there is an opportunity um, to do the right thing, um, be transparent and um, improve production practices and at the same time generate a value added product um, that um, does not cost more but has um, a higher um, attractiveness for the market. I'm just wondering too as well like um, I mentioned a lot of time that it was like uh, I'm just wondering what the role education plays in all of this because I mean there, there you talked about educating the veterinarian but I would also think there's like educating the farmer and then educating the public both on you know on the on the food side and on the human health side so I just like just curious if you could comment on the role of education. Well education is certainly central um, and I think for farmers, um, one of my experiences working in the US is what's been really helpful was educating about or sharing some of the experiences uh, from the human side. Um, I think on the human side, we've been fortunate that uh, there's been a little bit more attention and a little bit more funding over a longer period of time on this issue. So for instance, there have been some really interesting studies on what is driving uh, prescribing behavior uh, why are um, physicians making the decisions that they are making? What factors are impacting them? <laughs> they are oftentimes not making the best decisions, but understanding what is driving that, um, understanding the behavioral underpinnings, um, I think it's really helpful. And even though a farm is clearly different from a pediatrician office, um, I think there are lots of um, behavioral drivers that are transferable. Um, so I think it can guide the research and the types of questions that we are asking or that we should be asking on the um, animal side. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, for the general public education and I'm putting an emphasis on the importance of antibiotic resistance, why it matters to all of us. Um, I think that's very important and um, I think we've seen much more attention to the issue being um, placed over the last few years but it's certainly something that we need to continue to do. I was struck several times during your presentation by, um, by you saying there's a lack of data. Is it, is it just that it's such a huge area or is it just that it's like a relatively new field of study? I think part of the problem is, um, again, asking the right questions. Um, when it comes to some of the issues around duration limits, for instance, that I mentioned, these, some of these drugs were approved a very, very long time ago. If you think about what science, uh, what, what the state of science was 50, 60 years ago, what the uh, state of uh, technology was at that time, um, I think, uh, for instance, at, at that point, the drug approval process looked different. 
and there wasn't necessarily a need to minimize the number of days that an antibiotic was given uh, because there was not necessarily a broad recognition of the detrimental side effects related to antimicrobial resistance development. So some of that data uh, just hasn't been collected because um, our understanding of the science has changed or because our ability to collect information has changed. Um, and we know funding for um, agriculture, uh, agricultural research, at least in the US, is direly underfunded. We know that investments on research in agriculture have a very high ROI, but we know that uh, the funding has been uh, for a long time very underfunded. Yeah. So your discussion was very, is very focused on evidence-based policy. What would you good, uh, recommend as good communication methods with, to share this evidence with the public? Does social media help or hinder um, you know, sharing this information? That is a really interesting question. The first thing that our communications experts um, have told, uh, t told me when I started at Pew is uh, there is no one audience, even though sometimes we have to write to a broader audience. Um, we, the, the, there are different communication styles, there are different messages, um, depending on whom in our audience we need to reach. Uh, social media clearly has a role to play. Uh, to turn that back to a communications uh, professional like you, what is your view on that? You obviously have a lot more experience with this than I do. Um, with, with this topic, I think um, I, I actually am quite interested in antibiotic use. Um, I think the topic needs to get out through a variety of channels. Like we need scientists, um, people like Do Dr. Timothy Caulfield, who is at the U of A and you know, debunks myths. Um, we need people who are scientists who are strong um, and we need journalists to write articles about this. Um, the main, I, I work for an agricultural newspaper, but um, I think mainstream media is underfunded and there's a lack of good science journalism. Like, I mean, there's some great people, people who do great work, but just the way papers and media are right now, it's not always, I can't comment on broadcast journalism because I have no background in it. Um, but I, I don't think it's necessarily funded or delivered in a way that people can appreciate. Um, I also think that the, the audience of people that we're talking to right now probably have a more scientific background or a little more scientific knowledge than, than some people who just don't think about these, these kind of, or wouldn't be interested in these kind of issues. But I do think that it needs a strong front. Um, cause I personally have been kind of, um, concerned for both animal and human health use about, you know, me medications and, um, antibiotics and prescriptions. And I know what I, one thing I learned through being an agricultural reporter is that it does take a long time to come up with any kind of new technology, whether that be, be an antibiotic or a breed of a variety of wheat. It's, it's a long, it's a long process. And if you lose, if you lose that tool and you lose that resistance, it can really upset your system and nobody wants that. Um, since you asked me the question, as I've been an agricultural reporter for um, over 12 years now, and so I have seen, um, we wrote a lot of papers about, um, in Canada now you need a prescription for a lot of antibiotics. So we wrote countless stories about making a relationship with your veterinary, veterinarian and having to have that relationship and buy your prescriptions by only with prescription whereas before you used to be able to go to the store and use antibiotics which i think also could have um resulted in people not using them properly because they were possibly overdosing or underdosing so i have just in my short term of being an agricultural journalist seen a, a shift in the way that that producer like beef producers for example are talking about and using antibiotics yeah so i, I have seen that um but i wondered if you've seen that as well like have you seen in the time that you've been researching antibiotics have you seen a shift or a shift in interest 
Absolutely. I think when I um, joined Pew and uh, started working on this issue, um, people were starting to really come together and to realize that this was a topic that um, we can only really address if we all work together. So um, I saw a lot of coalition building in the beginning, a lot of um, getting at the same page, being willing to um, work together. I mean, I've really seen some tremendous uh, progress being made in um, finding really innovative ways of uh, reducing the need for antibiotics, understanding antibiotics always have, as long as they keep working, uh, they always have a role in keeping animals healthy, but uh, really figuring out how to use better uh, strategy, whether that's a combination of vaccines, management practices, pre and probiotics, uh, basically using all the tools. So I've certainly seen a lot of progress and I've seen some evidence being published uh, to demonstrate that. I think one big problem that we're struggling with in the US is having more hard data. I understand the challenges of collecting the data, of synthesizing and publishing the data, but I think ultimately that's what's going to be um, really transformative and really convincing. We've seen that in Europe, for instance, where, for instance, in the uh, UK, uh, starting to have um, electronic records of um, treatments and um, kind of recording the information, sharing the information in an anonymized way, analyzing doesn't work. Um, and I think we're seeing some tendencies towards that in the US now, which are really encouraging. Um, but again, it would be great to have more data to demonstrate the great progress that has been made. Do you think that also like just with COVID-19 that, um, you know, and the tie into human health and zoonotic diseases, um, is that going to change like the Pew the Pew Charitable Trusts, are they doing research in that area or is this going to impact your research at all? Like just, uh, it's, a, it's a vague, broad, open-ended question, but I'm just, I'm curious. So in the immediate term, we know that COVID-19 um, unfortunately will likely aggravate the antibiotic resistance problem. Uh, we have a lot of people who are very sick who need antibiotics for long periods of time. Um, there are also lots of concerns around potential um, misuse of antibiotics in the current crisis. Uh, so our human team has been very busy um, trying to get their hands around what can we do uh, because the threat has certainly been aggravated uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, otherwise, um, I think Pew is always trying to figure out where can we be most helpful. Um, and with COVID-19, it's a very quickly quickly developing um, crisis. So um, to the extent that we can be helpful in other areas in the future, again, we work on a diverse set of uh, priorities. Um, so I don't think I have good answers for that yet, but in the short term, yeah. certainly it's been a big focus on um, what the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on antibiotic resistance in the short term. Yeah. Well, and just in terms of, I know a lot of researchers are not sure what their organization's focus is going to be because even some research departments have just shifted at universities have just shifted to researching COVID. So other programs aren't, aren't happening. And but on a tip, oh, sorry. And just realizing that we, a lot of research has been just disturbed by the COVID-19 pandemic, by the restrictions on access to lab space and all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've written about that too at work, just about certain projects that are not getting done this year or certain funding that has not happened. Or I've talked to researchers who haven't been able to get into their labs. They're, you know, they're, they, they're just, they're, they're still barred from going to their labs right now. Um, so a totally different focus. Um, so you're in agricultural policy at Pew. Is there a focus um, right now in the United States right now on agriculture as part of the U.S.'s econ economic recovery? That's a really good question. Um, I think the way I want to answer that is um, the current pandemic has certainly in the U.S., in Canada, and 
around the world demonstrated how vital agriculture is to our society. Uh, we've seen uh, the um, tremendous reliance on uh, food supply chains. And I think that's become clear, not just to agriculturists, but to the general public. Um, I think it is very telling that um, grocery workers are, are essential workers, are dedicated as essential workers, um, and that they really are playing a, a tremendous role, as well as everybody else across the supply chains in keeping us fed and keeping our access to food. Um, so I think there is no doubt that agriculture is a central part um, of our economy and of our ability to survive and thrive. And so um, I think the current crisis has certainly um, elevated that importance to the general public. Yeah. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. So we will be sending the uh, webinar, uh, like the uh, YouTube webinar out to everyone who has registered. Um, I will just remind you that our next webinar will be on June 26th at 11 a.m. And it's called Canada's Beef Sector, Essential and Sustainable Looking Forward. And that one is going to be a panel discussion. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. And I'd just uh, like to turn it over to Dr. Karen Holsar for her closing remarks. I just want to thank everyone for um, the opportunity to uh, give this presentation uh, for the great uh, Q&A. And um, I'm just really excited to um, give this presentation as part of the inaugural um, lecture series for the Simpsons Institute. I think an institute uh, that uh, provides great scientific evidence um, and a partnership and collaboration to help us address some of these really key policy questions um, in um, agriculture is very direly needed. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you uh, today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you and have a great afternoon.